All right, let's go over another potential pageant link. This was posted on the Jean Benet subreddit, not Jean Benet Ramsey, just r slash Jean Benet, by Lapis Lazuli One seven months ago. The man at the mall. On December 22nd, JonBenet Ramsey appeared in a show at the Southwest Plaza Mall. A recent podcast on the topic discusses a man who is intently watching her. Here's the information I have seen on this topic from the timeline posted by Jameson, July 17, 2003. December 22nd, there was a little show at the Southwest Plaza. Pageant winners strutted their stuff in the mall. Jean Benet was there. It was sponsored by America's Royal Miss and was carried on the local TV station. No list of people who attended that event. From the Killing of Jean Benet episode 10 Predators podcast, at her talent show, three days before her murder, there's a man in a video that's seen in the background of her talent show intently watching Jean Benet. He's talking to another man down backstage, and as she comes on stage, he turns his attention towards her and walks away from the man pretty much in mid-sentence. And the guy turns around to see, well, what are you looking at? And then he sees that he's watching Jean Benet. Here's a video from the event. In this video, there does seem to be a man who walks down the stairs to face Jean Benet Ramsey when she starts her performance. His head is cut off. It's difficult to ascertain if this is the man mentioned in the podcast, but it's worth noting. Notice what the man is wearing. Khakis and a black fleece zip-up. It certainly looks like some version of the North Face Denali fleece we all owned in the 90s. Do you recall any dark fibers being found on the victim? Any thoughts about this man's shoes? Because he sure looks like he could be wearing a brown high-tech boot. Just some food for thought. A separate video of the event seems to show the same man at a different time during the event. This time we can see his face. Here are the stills. And so this is Inside Edition. They aired this clip. It was uploaded on their YouTube December 15th, 2016, but obviously it is much older. Who knows when they first aired it, but this is all clearly visible. Uh, I don't know if this man has been identified, but these were these clips were all aired on the news here. There's a separate account of a man intently watching Jean Benet from the adult Miss Colorado. We are unclear on which event this occurred at. It could have been at the mall event, or it could have been the All-Star Kids Christmas pageant in Denver earlier that month. Now, before we continue the post here, I mean, I don't know if how much can be read into this, because obviously people, when somebody starts singing in a mall, regardless of who it is, people might turn and look and watch. Um, I, I don't know how much can be read into it, unless, of course, this is possibly one of the other mentioned POIs. An email from UC professor Michael Tracy to Lou Smith. Several years back, one of my students told me a really interesting story. Susan Rajabi was Miss Colorado in 1996. She was also a student in the School of Journalism. She was in a class where one of the assignments was to write a profile of someone. She asked if she could do one about me. When Miss Colorado, who was also a contestant in the Miss America contest, asks if she can talk to you, one does tend to say yes. So we talked, and much of it was about my having done the first documentary, etc., etc. She told me a really interesting story. She had been a judge at one of the pageants that Jean Benet was involved in in 1996. After the judging, which Jean Benet won, Susan noticed a guy with whom Jean Benet seemed very friendly. She assumed it was Jean Benet's father and went over, shook hands, and said, You must be very proud of your daughter. He replies, Yes, I am. After the murder, Susan was home watching the news with her dad. Jean, John Ramsey's photo came up on the screen, identified as Jean Benet's father. She turns to her dad and says, that's not the guy I met at the pageant with Jean Benet. I pressed her on it, and she was adamant that it wasn't even close. Interesting. So this is from an email from UC professor Michael Tracy to Lou Smith. Now on the Killing of Jean Benet episode 10 Predators podcast. 
At the last talent show, right before her death, there was a talent judge named Susan Rajabi, and she was also at Miss Colorado. She was also Miss Colorado of 1996. She met a man who was intently watching Jean Benet and assumed that was her father and said, oh, you must be so proud of your daughter. And he replied, yes, I am. Days later, she sees the news footage. She realizes, hey, that wasn't her dad that I spoke to. That claimed to be her dad. I believe that it's important to see if the description of this man aligns with the other witness accounts. Are the man at the mall and the pageant man the same? Is this the same man that appeared at the parade? How about the man seen at the gas station in Charlevoix? Or the man in Charlevoix who asked for a ride to the airport? These witness accounts suggest premeditation, and if they can be aligned more closely, a better perp description may arise. And that's a very good point. Because if investigators just put all their eggs in the basket of the, the Ramses or Burke, whatever, they wouldn't investigate all these individuals. So now is it curious that someone would take credit for being a child's father. I mean, I guess, see, that's kind of weird. If this guy was a predator of some kind, would he say, oh, I'm not her dad, and open himself up for inquiry on why he's so chummy or friendly with Jean Benet and appearing to be her dad, watching her or whatever, joking around with her, or whatever, if he has no relation to her whatsoever? And it would be curious if John and Patsy were ever asked about this guy. Has this guy been identified? Was he simply a parent of one of the other kids at the pageant? And if so, that obviously doesn't necessarily mean he's innocent either, or guilty, but again, unknown. But these are curiosities that one would think would have been investigated properly. Some follow-up posts here. Recently, someone commented about the black fiber ev evidence that was found on Jean Benet. I didn't think anything of it until seeing your post, so I googled, and it seems like there were both black fibers, source unknown, and brown cotton fibers, source unknown. Plus, if I recall correctly, the unknown black fiber was said to be faux. I'm still looking for verification of that. Is it possible the black faux and the brown cotton fibers came from the black fleece and khaki pants? Regardless, if that were true, it would still not narrow down the suspect list. Fleeces like that were super popular in the 90s. Brown cotton could be for many things. And I was just about to say that if they didn't round out their post with that. There is a whole lot of people who wear black fleece and khaki pants. More follow-up posts here regarding the man seen in Charlevoix, both at the gas station and the guy who asked for the ride to the airport. I mentioned this in our previous episodes regarding Charlevoix. If you haven't checked out the previous episodes in the Jean Benet Ramsey podcast series here on Mindshock, make sure you check them out. We, we go over a lot of stuff. So these were two very significant witness reports. I wish we knew the witness descriptions of the gas station guy and the airport ride guy. I wonder if they could have been the same guy or they were more likely to have been two different guys. And even if they were two different guys, is one of them connected to the Jean Benet Ramsey case? few more responses here from a candy rose description of the guy in the gas station well-dressed bum other times dressed nicer guy was older than college age mid-30s carried a lot of cash he had a strange nose like it had been broken in the past he had longer hair shoulder length talked about ice skating said he had unfinished business in colorado he puts this incident closer to the end of september early october Additionally, in late fall 96, there was a man hanging out at the local Shell station going on about Colorado and brought up John's name. I'm, I'm assuming John Ramsey's. Talked about skating, wore a long coat, well-groomed, did not drive, had lots of cash. Wheelchair guy driver tried to contact Ramsey family after Jean Benet's death in regards to a person he picked up fleeing out of their front yard who wanted a ride to the airport. I mean, that's kind of strange, though. So there's just some random guy running out of the Ramsey's front yard of their Charlevoix home. Husband of one of the house cleaners worked at the Shell station and reported this to the Ramsey investigators in February 1997. So well over a month after. Gas station is near the corner of the end of the high school football field. The guy apparently hung out by the fence outside, too. He did come in, make small talk once in a while, talked about skating a lot. I had a theory at one time that the white cord on her could have been ice skate laces, but after researching it, the material composition for skate laces is different. 
The guy at the gas station would not have known the cashier was the husband of one of the housekeepers. It was not really known as it was a temp job. He did do a sketch with the original Ramsey investigators in the spring of 97, but no one knows where it is. Probably in one of the many boxes shipped to Linwood, the Ramseys have never seen it. See, I don't know. This is just too mind-shocking for me. So a sketch was done, and it was simply never shown to the Ramseys or anyone else because it was just forgotten. It was just disappeared into box. I mean, this is just weird. Does anybody else find this weird? Boulder PD came to the house three times, I believe, and never once dusted John Bonet's room here. Even after they knew about a cowboy guy, never took bedding, did not seal room. Another close friend and I were the ones who got the house ready for the Ramsey's June arrival, not the housekeepers, in 97, and I should have bagged the bedding. I didn't, as I thought the police knew what they were doing. I wish I had. So this is the husband of one of the house cleaners. Or the house cleaner saying this. Wheelchair guy is pretty much incapacitated now. No one to my knowledge has ever questioned him thoroughly. He lives near me somewhere, but I have been told he isn't doing well. A composite drawing... I mean, why did it, it... Lou Smith didn't do any investigating up in Charlevoix? I mean, wasn't he relatively thorough? A composite drawing was made during one of the visits by John Foster. John Foster brought a sketch artist on one of his interviews with the attendant. Sketch in possession of Linwood when Armistead boxes were shipped to him. Sketch was not made public, but she requested it so it can be posted. John and Patsy were not made aware of, of this composite... And she asks why. I wonder where is that sketch now? Whatever happened to it? Did the wheelchair man who picked up the guy running out from the Ramsey's yard ever give anyone a description? I mean, that's kind of crazy. Somebody gets murdered, a child no less, and nobody manages to follow up from a guy running out of their front yard at their second house. I mean, doesn't anybody find that curious? I mean, how often does a murder victim's family have someone just running from their other, from one of their two or three houses? I mean, it's kind of weird. Was there, I mean, I don't know. This is, the, the coincidence stack here is just way too hot. So from John Ramsey, the Charlevoix police came immediately and the man began telling me a long winding yarn. The heart of his story was that during the previous summer, he had been driving, so this was the summer of 96, he had been driving down Belvedere Avenue, which ran in front of our house, when he saw a young man run down the hill from the direction of that. Okay, so this wasn't after the murder. So that's, that's less suspicious and less coincidental. The man flagged him down and asked if he could get a ride. When the younger man got in the car, he suddenly blurted out, I hate the Ramses and I'm going to hurt their daughter. Okay, never mind. This coincidence is still valid. <laughs> Although, I mean, if this is true, of course. I mean, we need brain fingerprint scan for all, all people still alive here. The Charlevoix police wrote down the entire story and took the man's picture. The man said his conscience had overwhelmed him for having done nothing about reporting this incident for an entire year. I thanked him for coming forward now with the information, and the police took him home. I have no idea what became of him or of the information he provided, but the whole episode left me terrified. As I heard more about the story, I discovered that the frantic young man, who also supposed to have said that I had contact tri contracted with him to build a secret room in the Charlevoix house, and that I owed him thousands of dollars. He went on to claim that he had a green Pontiac parked in our neighbor's driveway, which he wanted to sell, as he wouldn't be needing it anymore. The whole story was confusing and bizarre, but extremely interesting. As the gray-haired man's story wound down, he had made a concluding remark to the effect that well, you know, the tabloids would pay a lot of money for this story. His final comment hit all my alarm buttons. While he was talking about something that could be very important to us, the man sounded as, as if he might be preparing to go fishing for cash in the tabloid stream, seeing what his story might be worth. And another point here is if someone really does have real information and they want to make money off of it, of course, they'd go, if they're the type of person that would exploit that to make money off of it, then they would do that. Conversely, there's also people who would make up stories and then try to make money off their made-up stories. The fact that someone's trying to make money off of something, that has obviously doesn't point to the story being true or not. There is a good timeline of events on a candy rose. I found this interesting, though, since the suitcase was not neatly packed 
or it was so neatly packed, the housekeeper assumed it was the pilots or guests. I have thought that the person could likely have been a pilot, owned their small aircraft, and flown back and forth between Colorado and Michigan. There is an air airport in Charlevoix. Charlevoix Municipal Airport is a city-owned public-use airport located one nautical mile southwest of the Central Business District of Charlevoix, a city in Charlevoix County, Michigan. Hostess left the house in impeccable order, though she called Patsy in Boulder to say a glass of wine was spilled and asked her what she wanted to do about it. Patsy calls the caretaker in Charlevoix to go check a wine stain and clean it or have it cleaned. She states her brother-in-law and family are coming for a vacation the following weekend. Stain is near the piano. Housekeeper stopped there midweek after the party. This is when the discovery of the suitcase and the boots is made. They assume it is the pilot or guest. She calls and leaves a message on their machine in Boulder. She is told later they never got it. At this point in time, the caretakers are not concerned about the boots and the suitcase as people are always coming and going there. Is that another red flag? House doesn't appear to be disturbed. Hostess cleaned up well. Upstairs is as they left it, except towels are moved. And bed appears messed up and not made the way they did it. They leave. And the Christmas Parade Stranger from A Candy Rose. This guy is still a mystery. I wonder if anyone was able to determine who he was. It was December 6, 96, during the Parade of Lights in Boulder. Jean Benet was sitting up high in the back seat of a Christmas red open BMW convertible with two other pageant contestants waving to the crowd while the song Jingle Bell Rock was played from the car. A plastic sign on the side of the convertible identified her by name and revealed that she was a child beauty queen. Family, so it had her name on there, so potential target there. Family friend Pam Archuleta held Jean Benet's ankle to keep her from falling. And is she related to the police dispatcher, Kim Archuleta? And that is, of course, the 911 dispatcher who took the call. I went over the Archuletas in a previous episode. And Michael Archuleta is, of course, the Ramsey's family pilot. So a lot of Archuletas in the mix here. As they went past one of the town's leading banks, a strange man walked from the crowd toward the BMW. Archuleta says he looked creepy and had a face full of anger and hatred that she will never forget. She had the impression that the man had seen Jean Bonnet before and recognized her. Well dressed in a tweed jacket and jeans, the man was in his 40s, tall and thin with graying hair. He stared at Jean Bonnet and walked to within two feet of the car. For Archuleta, the staring man's behavior marred what until then had seemed an innocent Christmas event that could have taken place in any town in America. But soon, the pageant programs were put under sinister spotlight because Jean Bonnet was found dead just 20 days later, and videos of the little beauty's pageant were played endlessly on TV. Now, if this guy is tall and thin, and in his 40s, graying hair, I mean, the guys in the pageant video don't really look that tall and thin. They look more average. Possibly even slightly overweight, maybe. Or at least not to be described as tall and thin. Okay, the running man seen early morning December 26th. So there's another running guy? Whoa, 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 what is this? A roommate stated that a co-worker... This is new mind-shocking information. I don't think I went over this before. Roommate stated that a co-worker in his print shop had heard KHOW radio Peter Boyle AM talk show within a few weeks after the murder of Jean Bonnet. A caller on the talk show stated she saw a running man described as tall, thin, with short brown hair, running from the crime scene morning... Perhaps early morning of the day, Jean Bonnet's body was later discovered in the basement. Caller stated she had informed police when she realized this eyewitness account might be significant if the running man was running away from the crime scene after killing Jean Bonnet. Caller stated that the police never interviewed her about her claimed eyewitness report. Wow, wait a second. Okay. So the caller stated she gave her name and address. She's a close neighbor of the Ramseys to the police. So, a, 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 <laughs> wow, wow. The neighbor, if this is true, if this is true, I mean, obviously it's an if, if this is true, a neighbor reports seeing a man running away from the house where a murdered child was killed 
and the police don't even interview her. Does anybody else strike this as weird? I reported this exactly or almost exactly this way months or years earlier on Boulder News. Ridicule of this purported eyewitness account has been the main noticeable reaction from amateur investigators. Police have noted the info, but I know of no further information. So are the police saying that this person did claim that the police have verified that some, that this individual did tell them this story? Therefore, a running man is a valid or at least a valid eyewitness account as far as can be determined to date. I have not yet attempted to get the KHOW taped radio shows to verify, was assuming police would do this. Also, Joe Barnhill, a neighbor and a man in his 70s, saying that he saw John Andrew or someone who looked like John Andrew. Another reason to interview the Barnes Barnhills, however, was that Joe had told the police he had seen Jean Bonnet's older half-brother, John Andrew, in Boulder on the evening of December 25th. John Andrew claimed to have been in Atlanta at the time. During the interview, Barnhill sheepishly told us he had made a mistake and apologized, saying that he probably would not even recognize the young man in the crowd. That went a long way towards firming up John Andrew's alibi. Okay, so let's just, I'll have to do a dedicated episode on John Andrew. I know a lot of people have requested that. Let's just, let's just say for the moment that it's not John Andrew. Just hypothetically, let's say it wasn't John Andrew. Let's say John Andrew has an airtight alibi. I don't know if that airtight alibi has ever been produced publicly, but let's just for the sake of argument on examining this line of inquiry. So is it possible there's this guy that was cited, then he was cited again. So he's cited by Barnhill the night before. He's cited by another neighbor the early morning of, running away from the house. Is this the same guy who was at the pageant with his face full of hate, but, and possibly the same guy in Charlevoix, but maybe not the guy in these videos? I mean, these are all curiosities. Let's not fall for black and white logical fallacies. Some of these accounts could be describing the same guy. But if the story is true about this guy claiming he wanted to hurt the Ramsey's daughter, I mean, that's, that's mind-shocking. And if this is the same guy that was witnessed running away from the house in the morning and possibly at the pageant, Another interesting post here by Juniper Jane. I tried not to make it long, but I have compiled all eyewitness accounts together for myself to see if there is a common thread in appearance. And there is actually a lot of information regarding odd sightings and happenings leading up to Jean Benet's death. Plus, there's the Amy incident, blonde man dressed in all black, the midnight burglaries. The other point of interest to me is the Boulder Shambhala Center which is about eight minutes drive, 30 minute walk from the Ramsey's old house. I also wonder if the kids took ice skating lessons anywhere or where they might have gone ice skating together in Boulder. The University of Colorado Boulder Recreation Center has an ice rink, climbing wall, and weight room. The distance from the rack center to the Ramsey house is about eight minutes driving, 15 minutes walking. So the Boulder Shambhala Center is uh, labeled a meditation center. From their website here, the Boulder Shambhala Center offers introductory meditation instruction, public meditation practice, and a variety of classes on the Shambhala teaching. Now what's curious is multiple members from the Shambhala Center were arrested in connection with child sex assault. Not just one member, there's multiple members here of various ages. And wow. Members and former members and teachers. So what is going on at the Shambhala Center? Hmm. Very, very curious here. And again, going back to whether there's a connection to the pageants, it seems like that's a very, very real possibility. If this was not a f perpetrated, a crime perpetrated by the family, either by accident or not, if this is an intruder, is it someone who had seen her? Because the Ramsey family themselves very public, as I've gone over. I mean, they even had video holiday postcard, video postcards that I've gone over in previous episodes. I mean... It's that they were a very, very public family in the newspapers, John Binet and all of these public appearances that even had her nameplate 
or her name clearly visible when she was appearing and announced. So someone who wanted to harm the family, certainly it would not be difficult to to track them down just based on how public they were. Now, all of these odd happenings leading up to the uh, to the, to the death of Jean Benet Ramsey are they all mere coincidence? This guy at the pageant with a face full of hate. This uh, r- somebody running from the house in the morning. Somebody running from the Charlevoix house the previous summer, saying they wanted to hurt Ramsey's child. I mean, is this all just too much to be mere coincidence? I will leave it up to the Mind Shock listeners to decide. Obviously, we have plenty more to go over, plenty more to cover in typical Mind Shock fashion with logic and reason at the forefront. If you enjoy the podcast, find it interesting and thought-provoking, and want to keep up awareness in all these cases, feel free to donate to our PayPal. Help support Mind Shock. Help us get more Mind Shocking episodes out there. You can also become a member right here on YouTube for exclusive streams and chats like and share twitter facebook reddit patreon patrons do get priority for case topic logical analysis code podcast to request you could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier make sure you subscribe to the channel or you can just go to youtube.com slash mindshock to manually check for the latest episodes questions comments theories thoughts suggestions rebuttals debunkings of any kind leave them in the comment section this is bruce mcguire signing off catch you guys next time